Well, welcome to the IBE. If you're new to our organization, um, we're, a reminder, we're here to champion the highest standards of uh, business behavior based on business ethics. Uh, we offer a program of training, research, and events to complement our advisory services. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Mark McGinn, uh, who is Director of Brand and Social Purpose at Edelman. Uh, Edelman is the global brand and communications firm. Uh, Mark has a, 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 a long career in uh, sustainability and cause-related marketing. Uh, his previous roles included leadership for sustainability marketing at, at, at O2 um, and cause-related marketing at RED, um, where he led marketing and communications, um, partnering with Apple and other brands to create those iconic uh, RED products in support of the fight against uh, HIV and AIDS in Africa. Um, but be before we plunge into Mark's um, uh, whistle-stop tour through the Edelman Trust Barometer, a few housekeeping uh, uh, issues. If you're having a technical issue, that you should see a raise hand um, uh, option for you. So uh, please, if you're having difficulties, do that. Uh, we want this that the latter part of this session to be interactive. So at any stage, you can ask questions, put them in the questions box, um, and we will try and pick up as many of these as we can uh, later on. We've also had some questions in advance, which is really helpful. Um, Mark's slides are uh, available in the uh, to download in the handout section, uh, and we've also included our, our 2020 um, public attitudes to business ethics survey in there as well. Um, there will be a recording of the, this webinar, webinar, which will be available to uh, everyone who registered, because not everyone uh, will have been able to join us today. And they'll also be available. It will also be available on our on our website. Um, we will be live tweeting through this event, so please join the the conversation and the hashtags you can see on your screen now. So, well, we invited uh, Mark to join us to talk about the implications for business and for business ethics of the annual Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, uh, for those of us who were, were with us just before the pandemic, we had a great session with Andrew Wilson around last year's barometer, which um, showcased a really significant opportunity for business and a significant opportunity for business ethics. Um, so, you know, Mark is going to tell us how the results have landed this year. Um, but perhaps, Mark, if we, if, we, if we could also kick off with a, a little reminder as to um, how the barometer works and where we stood last year. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to the members of the IBE for uh, letting me join you today to discuss uh, these issues and, and trust in 2021. Um, so as Mark explained, Edelman has been looking at trust for over two decades now, actually. It was instigated by the Battle of Seattle, the WTO um, a conference, which was uh, facing lots of protests. And actually the protests were unexpected and people didn't really understand why and who were these people who were so um, aggrieved and, and angry and, and what were the issues they were trying to um, uh, raise. That led to the formation of trust uh, barometer, understanding different audiences in society and how they perceive each other. And we look at four institutions, which is business, government, media and NGOs, and try to understand the relationship between them, but also the relationship between citizens and those institutions. Um, we think trust is fundamentally important um, because really it's a measure of the quality of any relationship between any institution or organization and people and one another. Um, it's also a progressive measure, it's forward looking. A reputation is more rear view and, and it's about what you've done. While trust is it, implicit in trust is the gamble I'm going to take on this relationship. It really thinks about how much I value your, your credibility, your dependability 
and therefore risks I might take in what we, you know, what I choose to do with you. And that may, for many of us, if we were in organizations that might be buying our products or services. So trust goes out every year and we go, this year was in 28 countries and we spoke to over 33,000 people. So over the two decades that trust has been running, it's been over a million questions have been asked now about trust to populate these studies. Um, and the great news about having these long-term studies is it also means we can look back over time and look at how these institutions' performance has changed. So if we can go on one slide, please. A quick recap of um, where Andrew uh, discussed last year with Mark about trust was, was this slide which is critical. And at the heart of this slide is, is just recognizing that trust um, through our analysis of trust over the years, has got two key component parts, which is the competence to do what you do and how ethical you are in doing that. And what we saw last year was there was not a single of our institutions sat in the top right quadrant. There was no one who was regarded as being both competent and ethical. The closest that came to it was actually business. Um, and you can see business leads on its competency. And just to be clear about what I'm talking about being competent, fundamentally, it's about an institution that's good at what it does. What I expect you to do, whether it be, you know, I buy a car that I expect to work, you deliver that and you do it well. Um, in terms of ethical, we ask people different attributes. You know, do you have an, a, a purpose? Is it effective in delivering that change, positive change? Do I believe you've had, you know, delivered acts that have had positive outcomes? Does it have a vision for the future that I believe in? Is it committed to goals? Is it honest or is it corrupt? And does it serve everyone equally and fairly or just the interests of a few? So those are some of the attributes of ethical when we ask the people this data. So that was the opportunity we saw last year, the top right quadrant, unpopulated by any institution. And then if you move on one more, please. The other area we, we called out last year of real interest was how effective ethics were at driving trust. And in fact, the ethical drivers were three times more important to a company's trust than competence. Um, now, that isn't to say, of course, if you are incompetent, you're going to be very trusted. You, know, you have to be competent. We have to believe you can do your basic function, you know, what you're offering as a product or service. Um, but beyond that, then the ethics become hugely important of shifting the dial on trust. On the right hand side of the screen were some examples from last year of actions being taken where the business sector was stepping into that role and recognizing that. And of course, this year, there'll be many more that you could populate um, with those little thumbnails. So we leave, move on one more to look at 2021. So 2021, of course, um, is a reflection. Therefore, we've been asking people whether they're going to be reflecting on 12 months, which is like none other for most of us in our lifetimes, which was a pandemic, a pandemic that really put trust, trust to the test. And of course, a pandemic that rose people's fears in many aspects of life. It also was a pandemic that um, questioned information and really drilled down some fundamental questions we've seen coming through, which was almost the kind of the searching for truth. Um, and we've actually titled the, the, the trust prompt this year, or certainly in some of the essays have been written, is about an information bankruptcy. And there's been this lack of understanding clarity about where does truth lie? There's also been some really interesting shifts between the institutions within the 12 month period, which we're gonna look at now, and not least for business itself. So we move on one slide, please. Firstly, of course, it's been an unusual year, an unusual year that meant that back th that this time last year, when Mark was talking to Andrew, um, we didn't know what we were about to step into. And then very rapidly by the end of spring, the whole world had changed. Um, it meant that in the immediacy, one thing that changed very significantly was the trust in government. You know, when there was one universal um, and uh, very clear challenge and risk to all of us, everyone united about one universal course of action. And trust in government increased because largely citizens, we didn't have too much choice. We were being told what to do, what we needed to do to protect as many, many of us as possible at both a global and a national level. And we saw a big uptick in trust in government throughout the spring and into summer, up to 61 points. It became the most trusted institution in the middle of last year, which it hadn't been um, throughout our two decades of, of monitoring trust. However, as we then enter January, from then until January this year, that bubble has burst somewhat for government. It's still higher than it was, but it's gone back down. Now, 
when we saw this happening, when we first saw the bubble emerging at the first half of this year, we did think it was a bubble. We recognized it was a unique circumstance. And of course, a lot of it goes down to how well you perform, your competence. And for many of us, particularly in the UK, the government's performance in the first half of the pandemic was questionable. And so we can see that we had a really large uptick for 24 points in the UK on the right hand side of this slide. But since then, it's dropped down by 15. Um, of course, since 2021 and the end of December, things are going really quite well in the UK in terms of vaccine rollout. So I'm sure we'll see a response to that as well. But the government bubble has burst somewhat in a 12 month period. Here we go on now, please. What that means is that business has become the only trusted institution globally. Now, I have to say in the UK, we're not quite at trust levels. For us, trust level is over 60. In the UK, we are at 59. But the UK data is the same pattern. It follows the same shape and the same pattern. But globally, it is the only trusted institution. So business is being held up as being the institution that people would turn to more than any other. And actually, it's more trusted than government in 18 of the 27 markets we measured. Um, so it's a real significant shift. I will just also just break out slightly that in some of the sectors, we are seeing some movements uh, downwards. So particularly in technology, professional services and fashion, there's been a six point decrease. Now in technology, which is at um, the heart of some of the conversation about the quality of information right now, um, you know, the social media platforms, the data we consume online, um, that has actually seen a nine point fall since 2012 in technology. And people are starting to become slightly more aware and differentiate between technology they use at home, for example, this webinar, and technology they might use to consume media. Um, and for many people that now is social media. But business stands alone as being the most trusted institution, unusual and a first for the business community. And if we go on one more, we can see where that's come from. You know, what was being highlighted last year is your opportunity the actions of business in the last 12 months has mean that people perceive business to be the only institution that is both competent and ethical. And that is a real position of strength. And of course, we've only just tipped over into the axes. There's much further we could move if we read the right behaviors as a community of business leaders. But we have taken the opportunity that was flagged last year. And that wasn't the ambition. The ambition was to do things right by people. But the result of which is that we are now assuming that position in that quadrant on our own. Government has moved in slightly. I can tell you that after Brexit in the UK, the government's um, coordinates were pretty uh, shocking in terms of being less competent. They've moved much closer to, to the core axes and we can see that business stands alone in that position. OK, we can move on one more. The backdrop of though, of course, what I've been alluding to is that there has been lots of confusion and we've talked about this infodemic um, that means there is a change in priorities for people and people do recognise this need to seek out truth and understand and take more responsibility for who they may trust in future and why they may trust someone. Um, so, of course, as a whole, in the last 12 months, prioritising my family and their needs has come to the fore. You know, we've gone down to real basic needs of our health, our well-being, um, and to many, for many people, livelihoods too. But next up, we see a real shift, huge increase, 46 points, 43 points in my media and information literacy and my science literacy. I need to make sure that I am validating information I'm told. I need to make sure I understand who's telling me this information. You know, there's an awareness amongst citizens that you know, maybe some of the truths that I'm being told are not quite as accurate as I thought or some of the information I've been shared, I am more um, aware of who's sharing this with me, which is a good thing if we are aware there is a, a, a plethora of misinformation out there. Let me move on one slide. The trouble is the aspiration for that behaviour and the reality of how good we are at it is fairly significant and still. So on this slide here, we see it's about the quality of my information hygiene. And we ask people questions about you know, how do they consume their information? To understand about their information hygiene. So we asked, do you engage in multiple news outlets, news sources? Do you try and avoid information echo chambers? Do you verify information that you're consuming is accurate? And do you vet the content before you share it? Now, if 
if you have if you score well in three of those then we consider you to have good information hygiene and so we're only at a quarter of people are exhibiting those behaviors of good information hygiene which is pretty striking um so these are numbers which are alarming in the gap between our aspiration and recognizing the problem and our current behaviors so where do people seek out information who is trusted out there so we go on one more slide please um, well, sorry, before I move on, this is really important. The, the implication in the real world is significant because obviously what we're seeing is a real difference in understanding of the merits of a vaccine, the merits of how our roadmap out of the current situation may look. This apply, you know, the, the implication of this is huge in terms of our life and our economy in the coming months, the coming year. Um, and of course, the news headlines coming out of Europe in the last you know, day are highlighting these issues when the confusion of information leads to a confusion of confidence and understanding and trust in some of the solutions that are being now presented. Um, in the UK, we can see the disparity there between those of good information hygiene and those with poor information hygiene. The real world consequence of that, you know, the headlines you've read about communities that are receiving lower dose of vaccines um, than others. Uh, so it's really significant that we, as a, as a group, and collectively we try and maintain the quality of information that is being shared and we encourage people to understand how to vet the information they are receiving because the real world implications of this are significant and when we think ahead in 2021 of what we're coming up we obviously have COP we have a, a, an event focused on a huge issue which we face which is global too like a pandemic but greater which is climate change in the solution for that we're going to have to ask people to change their lifestyles a great deal like we do right now with overcoming the pandemic and if people don't believe in the strategies, they don't believe in the outcomes, they don't believe the information, we will face similar challenges to those in that situation too. Okay, and if we go on now, please. Great, thank you. So who is trusted? Where are people getting information from? Well, we did flag this last year and it continues, which is the employer is the most believable. What we've seen over recent years is people retreating back to those that are in their locality those that are closest to them one of the largest or probably the largest institution that people really have contact with they still feel control over to some extent i can quit my job i can ask for change within my employment is my employer so the employer continues to be the most trusted institution and the communications of which are the ones that people would go to and expect to hear news about the world um, that they would believe and follow it does mean there is even further you know em emphasis on the quality of information that businesses should be sharing with their own workforces as well as externally but particularly with their own workforces to think carefully about what you're sharing and also think that, um, and, and understand that they do want you to tell them um, and be, give them clarity on some of the wider issues in society that um, that they're facing into especially now more than ever um, if we could go on one more please Great. So um, more broadly than that, it's not just who works for you. It's actually the role of business in society as a whole. You know, how do citizens perceive you? How do stakeholders of all kinds, as well as the people who work with you and in your value chain? Well, there's clearly a big shift that has been going on for a number of years. And I'm sure that last year Andrew spoke about this too, which is the expectation of business has changed. The role of what we, of, of a business leader has changed. There's a new mandate that the, the citizens of the world are asking people to take up in that role. And here are the facts from this year. You know, this is pretty much across the board, two thirds more or less are saying that CEOs should step in when a government does not fix societal problems. It shouldn't wait to be asked, it should step in. CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting for government to impose change on them. And CEOs themselves should be accountable to the public, not just the board of directors or stakeholders, our stockholders rather. So there is a real shift in who we think um, are we are responsible to within business and the role we need to take. We're both being invited to do more and there's an expectation we should be doing more. Um, and we're seeing that that's, that, that that's not just this year, that it reaffirms a trend we've seen for the last few years in this space. And then if we go on one more slide, please. Great, thank you. So just to make that clear about the leadership role, you know, 86%, nearly nine out of 10 people expect CEOs to publicly speak out about one 
one more of these societal challenges. And, and, and on the right there is a list of four of those challenges we've, we've highlighted. The role of a business leader is a role as a leader in society as a whole, is a role to step in some of the challenges we face and to ensure that, that position of trust that is earned by business um, is delivered against to the actions we take. Um, and Mark, that is a very brutal and quick summary of, of this year's 2021 Adam and Barometer, but hopefully that might provoke some questions to step into now. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mark. Um, that There is, as always, with um, your very wonderful piece of research, a, a just a huge amount to digest and a huge amount to, to think about. Um, but thank you very much for uh, taking us through the headlines uh, th that quickly. That was really really useful. I, I mean, maybe I could start off with one um, question, which might sound si slightly cynical, but uh, you know, great to see business in there in the in the top right hand corner for the first for the first time. Um, but trust is a relative game. Uh, is is it because business has actually been has, has done a better job of this over the last 12 months or is it just that uh, uh, a lot of other people have fallen by the wayside yeah yeah great question um the the, the performance of some institutions is pretty depressing if, if i'm being very honest and that's that's you know unfortunately the, the reality of what we've seen now across the board actually since 2012 um all institutions have improved their trust it's to a greater and lesser extent now, to the greater extent, actually, government and business have improved most. So since then, in almost a decade, business has improved by 12 points and government with the uptick currently is up 18 points. Now, the government started from a long, long way further back. The result of that, it means at the start of this decade, NGOs were the most trusted. And by the end now, business is the only and the most trusted institution. Um, and that's a real shift. Now, NGOs have improved, but nowhere near as much as business. So I think that what we're seeing is a solidity of business's performance. And I think that goes back to the difference is the competency of business. And the business is seen as the people who both have the better ideas. Business is seen as people who are more importantly are able to deliver against those ideas. Business, business is where they see innovation coming from and they see you know, solutions in practice come from the, the most rapid real change happening. And we had a fact last year that 55% of the public believe it's easier to mobilise business and governments around societal problems, which is worryingly damning for government, quite frankly, but also I think is a real signal to the role business plays in life today, where we do move at greater pace and people expect much more direct influence to be available to them. And I think what they feel in the last decade is that they were able to and they saw much more rapid change coming from business than they have from government and media and NGOs. Now, these are perceptions. And so this is not judgments by me about each of those institutions. But I do think that there has been an, a, an increase in business performance over that time, um, as well as a relative decline of others. Um, but I think business is standing up on its own two feet because of those two factors being both competent, which is a huge driver for them, and now ethical too. Well, and you know, let's not forget um, perceptions really matter. You know, your customer's perception is your reality. It, um, uh, you're right. uh, um, you know, that's the, that's the value of again of these of, of, of these insights. Um, you know, one of the uh, interesting things and startling things ha has been, you know, the volatility that we've seen in terms of some of these uh, uh, some of these groups, uh, the ups and downs for, for government. And I, I, I don't know if you're already seeing evidence of, of, of a vaccine bounce, but uh, the feeling is certainly that, that that's likely to, 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 to come through. They've had a, you know, a good opening quarter and a good closing quarter to the pandemic and, yeah. and people quickly forget the bits in between. The, the pain before. Uh, yeah, but you know, but, but by contrast, and again, one of the reasons we included in the in the handouts uh, pack are um, uh, our public attitudes to 
business ethics survey is that you know which we've been doing now for 18 years and it's shown a very slow gradual increase in trust in in, in business with some dips and setbacks but not nothing like the um uh you know some of the some of the spikes that that, that others have seen in the last um uh in the in the last 12 months um well two things you know as one of our audience has, has asked we mustn't be you know business mustn't be complacent about this that, that those those yards have been hard won and that progress has taken uh, a long time to to achieve but actually there's you know there's also there is an opportunity for business in that the, the some of that trust in business seems to have built on have been built on more robust foundations than perhaps some of the other uh, other institutions yeah, I mean, your point around no, let's not be complacent is absolutely right. You know, we always say trust, you, know, you earn trust in drips, but it leads in floods. When you make the mistakes, it goes. And so you, you have to stay um, you know, true to what your, your, your dependability that people expect of you and the integrity in which you behave are crucial to maintain it and continue to grow it. The volatility, you're absolutely right. And um, it's early, too early for us to see the vaccine bounce. We fully expect there will be one for the reasons you said. Um, you know, the big challenge, as, you, as we saw, the huge bounce that the UK government had in the first half of last year and then a very, very significant drop second half. I imagine it may not be quite as much as a bounce the second time around, but I'm sure there will be a bounce because right now uh, things are looking more positive. Um, and that goes back to that core you know, element of competency. We're talking about the government being able to deliver a plan it had. Now, for some time, they didn't, didn't appear to have a plan, but there is now a plan and they, they are delivering incredibly well you know, and, and deserve a huge amount of credit. So you know, I think that is, again, going back to those axes of you know, are these people competent? And which we saw for the government was they, that was the biggest move they had to make to pull themselves back at seeing delivering on, on those plans. So I think that we will we will see about. You're completely right about business. Its performance has been you know, in your in your study ours too. It's been the most consistent performer. And so that that over that last decade we spoke about the fact it's now emerged as being the most trusted um, institution and the only trusted institution right now. Um, it's been a continual performance and improvement throughout that decade. Um, so it hasn't had the same extent of volatility. Um, and government definitely does experience that with some external events that, that occur. We certainly saw after the Gulf War further back, there was a real drop off in the government's uh, trust in government. Um, so there are those you know, huge events that are happening that affect certainly government's performance. While business has been very steady, continue to perform, um, that doesn't mean it's time to take your eye off the ball. Actually, it means that there's probably more expectation to do continue to perform at this level. And I think that hopefully the charts are showing is the expectation of citizens is greater on business now than ever before. Um, therefore, what we need to uh, uh, what we need to meet, we need to meet those expectations to maintain our current performance levels. And you know the uh, uh, the key question that we that we that we teed up in advance of this event is it really is it realistic to expect business to to fill that void? How how far should can business really be expected to do, to do this? So I think that I, I think that there's clear roles. I don't think I don't think people are saying that you know governments the, the role governments play should be now behind for business. That's not the expectation there. But they do expect business to to do more. And I do think that there has been I think there's a recognition in the business community that that is true. There is you know, there's been the direction of travel for some time had gone wayward. And yeah, you know, we had uh, some facts, I think you discussed with Andrew last year, that were really startling, that you know, only one in five people globally, when we asked them in 2019 about the system, and that includes you know, the economy and how it's currently structured, only one in five thought the system worked for them. Now that, that is an, a hugely, hugely alarming um, data point, um, because that suggests something's fun, crucially broken, and also suggests there would be room for um, you know, dramatic change. Um, and so we know the world is out of balance in many aspects, you know, economically, um, in terms of social inequalities, we know that environmentally, and so we know that the people believe that governments, um, uh, that business has a huge role to play in correcting those. Uh, and that is both a credit to them that they've earned a position where people perceive them to be competent to be able to come up with the solutions 
um, and to be able to deliver a, deliver the solutions we need. It's in hope that they also give us that uh, mandate as business leaders to try and deliver against the expect you know the, the issues we have in society. Um, but I do think they understand that it's not that you know there is a different role for the different institutions to play amongst that. I don't think people expect business to fill the void. I think it you know we require everyone to work together across all four institutions to help improve trust levels. We all benefit from trust being higher in society across the board. We need to hold each other to account when people are you know are breaking down trust um, with citizens, um, and that is on all part, all sides. Uh, and so business has a role to play to work with government to help them improve their trust levels um, and also for business to meet the expectations uh, that people are setting of them. And, uh, you know, that sort of segues into a, uh, uh, into one of the other questions with, that we've had in, in, you know, what, where, where are the banana skins here? What, you know, what, what should, what should business um, watch out for so that we don't go rapidly backwards given how hard it was to get to this uh, to this position in the first place what should we be what should we be paying paying most attention to i think that there um i think the most apparent currently is the rush to be seen to do the right thing mm. and it, it it should be a rush to do the right thing and then after you've done the right thing of course tell people about it of course gain reputation of course be seen to be the right thing because you're doing it but do the right thing first um, and we've certainly seen a bit of a backlash between the high expectation that people have on we want business to step in and onto these challenges we've given you some data points there we also saw some data points recently that they the perception that um, a lot of companies are now using issue societal issues for marketing first rather than genuine societal impact so the watch out for me is that if you're going to be credible in these space, if you're going to act ethically, it means you act with real impact first. You make sure you act robustly and you check that your programs are working and that you are, you know, whatever the target you have, whether it be around societal issues or environmental issues, you know, you are holding yourselves to account to that performance. And then once you know it works, and once you have can make the wrong, the right long-term commitments to help solve those challenges, then of course tell people. But there is a cynicism amongst the public that companies are too quick to make statements um, and too slow to act. So there is a slight gap emerging between what they hope companies will do and their belief that companies can make change and then what they feel like they're experiencing. Um, so th that would be the biggest flag for me. And, and you know, it's, uh, we've all seen the accusations of purpose washing. Um, it, I mean, in the same way that it took a little while before people got quite cynical about uh, company statements about the environment. There was a, there was a, a little honeymoon period where people believed what they were, yeah. uh, thought that it was representative. Um, I, I think we're going through the same period in relation to in relation to purpose. Well, you know, what what what's the sort of organisational secret? I mean, is it is it is it to keep it keep it away from the marketing um, uh, team, or is it to or is it to uh, engage the marketing team and but you know make sure that it's proportionate and appropriate and and is a report yeah, on that, delivery I rather than probably, aspiration? Yeah, I think that um, I mean much like sustainability, um, the journey, actually the, your analogy is actually the right analogy. You know, when sustainability was held in in individual teams, individual departments, at the end of a corridor, that was a problem because this is a business transformation we're talking about. It's, it's, it's everyone's um, agenda who works in a business and is a leader in a business. Likewise, if it's a genuine purpose, it shouldn't be in one team. It, it, it's something that should be, it'll be driven by one team for sure, but it should be something that it is, if you're committing to as a business, it's a business transformation. It's how you do business. It should be everyone's agenda. Um, I think the watch out for marketing and for commerce teams is probably let's do first and then we'll talk about this, but they should be involved. Um, and it must be driven from the top, but also with energy from below. It's not a top-down initiative. You know, the top have to show the commitment to this, and preferably, you know, by showing the commitments in both investment in the programs and in the KPIs it sets its individuals and its organisation as a whole to show that this commitment is real and that they will that that is a key area of performance that they will hold themselves to account on. Um, and then they need to make sure the programs are uh, preferably long-term. With hard metrics of success that they deliver against 
and also let's not mark our own homework. You know, if we're working around environmental or societal issues, let's ask experts in the field to come and check whether we're doing a good job or not, and then be open to criticism and find out how we can do better, um, and be open to collaboration and find out how we can share our learnings with others to help others do better. Um, because of course, the problems we're talking about in broadly in purpose and in sustainability, they're bigger than any of us, and they require us all to move, you know, in mass to be able to solve get problems at the scale the map, solutions rather the scale that match the problems we're facing now you know at the moment business is just one spot on that on that chart and um and i think you know business community as a whole has 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 made a um you know reasonably consistent contribution to that steady growth and trust but if business really le leans into some of these societal issues and if we get you know a backlash against purpose washing and if we get some real credible differentiating um uh, uh, uh re re reporting out there for for businesses that are really transforming their um the, the way they do business as a, re as a result of this you know we should we, we should see two things we should see probably you know much more volatility in it's one of the questions that we've had much more volatility in relation to businesses score but but a massive amount of, of, of differentiating within within business um is that is that what you're expecting to to see that there'll yeah. be a broader range i think we will see a um and i and i hope we will i and i hope we will because i hope we will reward companies and businesses who step up to the duty they have to society and, and play an active role and those who maybe are slower to meet some of those requirements that they should that they should they have um and i think that if the consumers start to or citizens start to differentiate and understand better through better transparency and better information the performance the real world performance of one company from another um I don't think I don't personally think that's a bad thing because those companies and individuals and companies who have driven positive change, they deserve the success that should come their way, um, and uh, I and they deserve to have um, competitive advantage because of it. Um, I think an interesting sector where we're seeing that already actually, Mark, is technology, and I think that you know technology lived in a quite a privileged position in our trust barometer for many many years it was by far the most trusted sector and just in the last five years we've really started to see that pedestal shift and as i mentioned we're also seeing an understanding of citizens about technology and differentiating between within technology what we might mean and before there was quite a low understanding it was kind of all of it was digital technology it was all technology and now people are understanding that there are different you know fundamentally the social media platforms versus other forms of technology you know hardware versus software and there and there is a certainly within that space a real shift in trust levels within that sector um, and that is you know we weren't going to take as a, a whole world of information and, and discussion in, in in that topic but but I, I think there will be a more volatility and um I hope business moves as one as much as possible but I also hope that companies that show most a most progressive outlook and genuine commitment are rewarded too. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's very fair. Um, a, a couple of interesting questions here. I'll, I'll deal with the one that's come in live first of all. Is you know is there a correlation between optimism and, and trust? You know how much does it move just because people are feeling good about the world? But, yeah um i mean it's a great question it's a great question and um i mean you know government you, you suggest that that's what we're seeing with with government but um it's it's hard to see that um, um, it would be harder to see that correlation with business yes exactly right i, I mean the reason i was pausing because i was thinking do, does our trust problem to have that data point uh, that, you know that mm. and i don't think we i couldn't answer it with a data point so it's the first of all so beyond the data point we could talk about what we really think trust is and and trust is earned you know tr and, and that's a, a misgiving that people have that you can buy it you can quickly get it you can create it you earn it through your behaviors and you earn it over time 
Now, once you are trusted, you know, as an individual in your personal relationships or as an organization, you get to a position where someone's probably, you know, we can use the word optimistic, more optimistic with you. And um, they're probably more positive with their intent around you. They have more positive assumptions about what you may do in future, that you're going to be good and fair and honest and, and the intent behind your actions will be positive. Um, so it's probably a, a virtuous cycle there where that optimism breeds greater trust. But I do think that the optimism, we're all affected by it. We all have our biases, unconscious or conscious, but trust is earned. Trust isn't, isn't quite so um, volatile as that. You know, it comes with over time and from a series of, um, of experiences and, and, uh, that you have with a person or, or, or an organization that means that you feel to a place where you have hopefully a more positive intent about, about them or you assume a more positive and we, you know, we had a related question uh, uh, or another aspect of this, you know, submitted bef before the event, which was, you know, which was about the sort of relationship of of intent in relation to to, to trust. I, you know, I've, I've been um, I've been in companies which have, have said, "Great, you know, we're going to have a trust initiative and a trust program," and it's felt that hang on a minute, that's the outcome, not the. Yeah. Uh, you know, not not the journey. The journey is along separate paths, and if you and and if you get there, that's that's great. You know, the other the other uh, extreme, of course, is is to say that you know trust is perhaps just a happy accident. But um, I think the truth is somewhere in between, isn't it? That you you need to you need to have a focused effort on the foundations, but the outcome is not something that you can just have a you know a program directly to achieve. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, tr trust is, uh, yeah, you, you can be, we will behave in a way which is trustworthy, but we will do that to earn someone's trust. And it's in their gift to give that to us. That's their judgment on what we've done and their experience of us. So your description of, you know, this is a trust program. Um, I fully, I, we understand the sentiment, but I fully agree with you, Mark. No, this is a program which we do the right things and the outcome of which is, you know, we will earn trust and we have proven ourselves to be trustworthy. And these are the things we do to get there. Um, and then on the way, our, the outputs of these actions are gonna be these goals and whatever they might be, you know, a fair pay for living force or gender equality in our workforce. These will, the outcome of all of these will then be we are trusted. So I, I'm fully aligned with you on that. Um, and I think that, you know, which way round does it come? I, it, trust comes first. You, once you are trusted, I think you get to a place of people thinking positively of you. Um, mm -hmm. It isn't a byproduct of just being looked at favourably or people feeling optimistic that day. Um, I think I, I think in the in the or one of the questioners um, insinuation is do we get uplifts of people being positive and optimistic about the world? I think there's probably that's that's probably likely. I don't have a data point to prove it. I think it's probably likely. Um, but I still think that trust is a quite a robust measure, more so than others, that requires long term. Uh, judgment of performance or your performance um, and it goes before people treat you with positive intent. Now you know we've heard quite a lot in the um, uh, you know over the last 12 months about company purpose um, uh, and you know how that's been a north star for for uh, you know for many organizations you know kind of our our view is well yeah, but you need you know it needs to be a lot more than that, and and you know we we see if, if you're really going to Im, Im, embed your um your your company purpose, you need to you know you need you need to answer the the, the how question of how we're going to get there, and that's where your 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 ethical values and your culture and your day to day behaviours come in, and that's what really creates the. The sense of belonging within within an organisation. Do you think, you know, a, co a company's is the market sort of really um, waking up to the impact of of ethics and ethical values? Uh, do people really understand the, you know, the driver that was that was on last year's slide that was so uh, 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 that was so dramatic? Yeah, I really think they, do, they are. I think that they're. Um, and even if it starts on a point of enlightened self-interest, that's absolutely fine because I think that people are really seeing the need to correct 
um, the, the, the course that perhaps we've been on for some time. And, and I think it has been going on for, you know, Mark, you, you'll be able to tell me, you, you, you've been close to space for a long time, but I think it's accelerated in the last, certainly five years. In the last three years, <clears throat> I think what's really accelerating the emphasis and the belief in this needing to be um, delivered correctly with governance and with um, you know systemic approach is the shift in the investment market and the understanding of both the, the consumer with the evidence been there for a long time will make a choice will prefer a company which more importantly they'll stay loyal to a company that they believe is trusted um, we know the workforce and as we know that you know millennials are going to be the majority of our leadership teams by 2030 having to reflect their point of view let alone the, uh, the, the gen Zers that come next and their their value sets you need to do that right now which is we are at the heart of lots of this behavior but more importantly and what i think is really driving a lot of change in the boardroom is the investment community shifting on this and that the the really the you know the the, the money is changing the flow of the revenue uh, the revenue the the investment is shifting now um, with real hard commitments expected, with difficult questions being asked, um, and I think that, that that perfect mix of all stakeholders aligning um, is now really starting to change the conversation around purpose in the organisations. Now, the word purpose can can come and go. Like I don't think any of us are that precious about that. The point of what it is, the point of what it's meant to represent, the point you said around you know setting objectives as a business that are you know, thoughtful about the role across society as a whole, including the environment, putting that into play with your values and setting a culture which is true to that and holding yourself true to that um, with a strategy that then makes that real in the transformation across the business is what we mean. Now, if we swap out the word purpose in 12 months time, two months, I'm sure it will change, no doubt. Um, but the, 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 the approach we hope won't and we hope the approach will remain um, uh, committed and will accelerate in more organisations. And you know, again, I think a lot of us are hoping that whatever the you know return to the office and whatever the return to uh, at least a a new steady state looks like, it builds on the best of the learnings from the from the pandemic. It it, it was extraordinary for for me, um, being a deeply cynical person who spent many years um, involved in internal communications to discover that anyone trusts that, let alone that it should be the the most trusted source of, of information. That you know that's a really scary, scary thought. But you know how much of the how much of you know I think there have been great things that have happened with internal communications over the last 12 months. They've been they've been they've been yeah. they've, they've been leader led uh, they've been very personal. They've been they've been humble. They've been authentic. They've been free from from jargon. That you know they are higher risk. You know we saw from from KPMG that that um, actually unscripted stuff can can go wrong. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, you know even if it's delivered with the even if it's delivered with the best intent, um, the you know but how are you getting a feel for how much of that sort of secret source that's been discovered of simplicity and authenticity in the last 12 months is, is, is likely to continue. Yeah, I think Mark, you hit the absolutely right word with authenticity. And um, I think it's been, it's been a, what, what, like there's been many, but it's been one of the lovely um, positive outcomes that we none of us saw coming. And, and part of, I mean, look at me, I'm sitting in the spare room of my house talking to you. When else would I talk to you and your members from my private home? And the context of that is that people have seen each other for, for who they are, which is they're human, they're people, they're individuals, they all have their own battles, they've got kids downstairs and they've got pets that are barking, whatever it might be. And I think that that has meant that the nature of communications between one another, especially internal communication, where there is a, you know, a level of, of trust there about how you know, they're perhaps more informal they can become, is slightly different to external communications. It's changed things dramatically. Um, and also, you know, I think what's also terrific is that the move towards being really aware of the welfare of workers beyond the physical, but the mental has accelerated in this year, which we, we saw was coming. But, you know, we, we were aware of the huge strain and stress um, working from home has put on people. 
and the data points have been really you know startling about that and what I, I think is really terrific to have seen is that the leaders have stepped into that challenge as much as they can it's difficult of course in certain circumstances but they've stepped into that challenge from very much a personal perspective because we are all remote you know they can't gather people in a town hall they can't gather teams together um, and I think that that's also been a real shift in the nature of the dialogue um, and it's become more of a dialogue rather than simply a broadcast um, and it's become a much more honest conversation about um, we are a group of individuals who all face our challenges moving towards one goal set by the organization and I think that's been a real positive from and I do hope it continues um, and I, of course the change of workplace I think I think few would argue we're going to go back to what we were only 13 months ago um, I, I'm sure that um, many of these changes will, will stick. None of us know what it will look like in 12 months from now, but I'm sure it won't be what it was at the start of 2020. I, I'd agree with that. And, and do you want to comment a bit, a bit about, you know, I think it's, the, I think it's your local leader, and um, you know, I've always had a bit of a uh, um, hobby horse about uh, middle management who just get dumped on from all angles you know, it's the, it's the, it, it, you know who asked us to, to solve the uh, irreconcilable conflicting uh, initiatives from 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 above and all of that but actually you know what what we, what we saw um to to a huge extent over the last 12 months is is, is local teams solving local problems uh, and doing that incredibly well and, and a tidal wave of 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 empowerment now of course you know Again, plug for business ethics. If you if you are in a values-led organisation with strong, well-embedded um, uh, ethical values, people are probably likely to make the right decisions um, yes. locally as well. So you know those businesses have done better. Um, yes. But I think there's some interesting stuff in your report about um, you know the the relative impact of your local leader versus. Um, uh, CEOs as a whole, and if and one of our questioners had looked back a couple of years and seen how in you know 20, 29, in your twenty nineteen survey CEOs and boards um, you know were well behind technical experts, regular employees, and a person like me in terms of people that they would they would trust. So you know how's that how's that played out at the different levels of of, of leadership? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a, your first point, Mark. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I, you, know, t you made a really lovely point about the, the importance of clarity around the values. Which is, you know, we're going back to the purpose conversation. I had a conversation with one client who was felt like purpose was restricting people, and that they had. To, and I said, you know, it's the complete opposite. Once they've got that clarity around what the objective is and the direction of travel and how the, your organisation behaves, you free them up to make decisions that they know align with that, and you free them up to also speak out when it's not right. Uh, because they've got absolute clarity of the organization so i think that's a great point and, and i think that we've seen that during the COVID crisis and i think many leaders on this call would vouch for how unbelievably grateful they are for their local teams or, or the teams down down through the system to have stepped up in the way people have had in such unbelievably challenging circumstances in the last 12 months that can only be done when you are close to your teams and we're close to understanding the issues you face um Going back to the spokesperson uh, credibility co uh, comment for the question that, that yours was called in by a member. Um, unfortunately, spokespeople have lost their credibility <laughs> across the board in the last 12 months. I think with that cynicism and, and misinformation that's been spreading. Um, CEOs are still down compared to being a technical expert within a company. So if your CSO wants to talk about your sustainability initiative, that would make more sense actually than your CEO. Um, person like yourself, an academic, remains incredibly high. There, there is a return a little bit or to expertise, that's what we're seeing. CEOs have actually had about four point drop in the last year, board of directors a five point drop. Technical experts in the companies have actually had a 10 point drop, but still considerably higher than a CEO. Unfortunately for journalists, they're still amongst the least credible, which is um, a real shame actually. And I think some of the reporting in the last 12 months being so strong, um, hopefully yeah. will help call them, call them back on that. Yeah. And what you know? What would be your words of encouragement? We've got a lot of ethics practitioners um, uh, on on this call, and and who will be watching the um, the reruns, the endless reruns. Um, yeah. you know, what's what's your message of hope and inspiration to to our ethics practitioners? What should they be doing with your report? What should they draw on, and 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 what conversations should they be trying to have? 
I think um, take great enthusiasm that your time is now, that you're all stakeholders are telling leaders that this is what they expect of businesses. This is what they hope this will deliver against. And they also, this is what they'll hold you to account for. And so I think, you know, take that, take the data, use it for your own difficult conversations you have to have in-house and believe that now is a time to really accelerate. And, and to do that, you know, make sure people within the organization understand this new role that is expected of them and start to embrace it by starting with action. You know, implement the change, implement programs that deliver real impact and make sure you're keeping track of that. You know, in this current wave of also misinformation and, and, and unfortunately low trust levels, we are in, in, in a position of trust as an institution of, as business, but let's lead with facts. Uh, let's lead with those facts and keep that, you know, don't neglect that. Let's make sure we stand out by giving clarity. Act with empathy still, like you've mentioned, Mark. Yeah, this has been really good in the last 12 months that people have spoke, you know, we were just discussing it on much more relative terms to each other with real empathy. Um, and don't go alone. And remember that these are huge issues and that both in our position as trust as businesses, we should then help pick up those who may have lost a bit of the trust uh, footing they had, NGOs and governments. We all need each other to get over these some of these challenges and people recognize those who work collaboratively and in partnership to deal with some of the problems and to promote their own um, uh, their own agendas. So I think those would be my call outs, but just remember uh, really now is the time. And if we could you know, pull out the crystal ball, um, with you and I are sitting down in 12 months time and, and having uh, the conversation about next year's, uh, next year's barometer, what, what would be a good outcome? What would you be hoping to, to see as the themes emerging from that? I, you know, I, I, I hope that, tr that business continues to move upward on that y-axis, as in I think that I, I hope business continues to demonstrate behaviours which means that people perceive it to be ethical. And I think the competency, I'm not worried about that because I think business and the nature of business, um, we means will continue to deliver um, products and services and, and, and to people's needs. I also hope that they're not alone though. And of course, I really hope that NGOs see a movement in the, in the people, their perception yeah. of being competent because they have some great people doing great work and we let's make sure that's understood. I really hope media moves a dial and there's a lot for media to do better in that space because without that functioning well, we're going to suffer from mistrust going forward, which I've already alluded to, the issues that can be in the real world. And of course, I absolutely hope, because we're writing the checks for it, that government shows its competency um, in the next 12 months and that we see them continue to improve too because then we are facing you know at least five years of a bigger government than we've ever seen in any of our yeah. lifetimes and so let's hope that that is a really competent operation um, uh, as much as anything else. Yeah and, and I, you know just on one of those I, I, I do think that um, although it's been a horrendous uh, pandemic for for many NGOs, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I think that I think we will see an acceleration of of um, uh, you know, if you like, professionalisation and more business like approach um, across that that sector. So I, I would, because uh, you know, the last thing we want is business being the only occupant of that sector. We want we want other institutions to be in there that we can learn from um, right. and who are, are ahead of us and uh you know actually actually i think you know i think the field is is open for for uh ngos to make a significant lurch into that into that um uh top quartile as well yeah let's share let's share the quadrant that's our aim for next year exactly well it'd be nice to have everyone in that quadrant that would be able to be aspiration um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so before um, uh, before I'm shut down, uh, I, I want to, you know, thank uh, well, well, thank Aikman for for, for sharing the, the 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 research with us. It's a fantastic it's a fantastic report every year, and it's a you know it's a really it's, it's always packed full of um, thought-provoking things, but most importantly, to thank Mark for his time in joining us and walking us 
through it. Um, there's a lot in there, and it would, and I, I hope we've managed to get to some of the points that um, are of particular res resonance to our audience to today. I know there's loads more we could have spent the entire afternoon talking about. Um, it was very much appreciated, and we may also, Mark, you know, um, lean on you to 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 follow up a little bit on some of the themes that we've that we've talked about today. But thank you so much uh, again. I think everyone's it's been a, a, a really the, the hour has flown by, and it's it's been a lot of fun. So thank you for that. So quickly before we close, um, just as a reminder, there will be a video uh, recording of this uh, webinar uh, made available to everyone who registered for the event, even if you didn't, uh, weren't able to join it, um, but also uh, available on our website. The uh, Mark's fantastic slides are available as a handout. And of course, if you go to Edelman, you'll be at Edelman's website, you'll be able to see the full trust barometer. Um, a quick plug for our for our upcoming events. Um, the next thing we have in in the pipeline is uh, an embedding business ethics training course. Uh, it's there's still time to register for that. That uh, starts on the uh, on the 8th of March. Uh, I am reliably informed my my colleagues that it's packed with practical tips on how to manage your ethics program effectively. So please sign up for that if that would be of interest. Uh, and a final request, when, as we close down, there will be a survey, feedback is a gift, and we would very much like your, your feedback on today. But uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks again, Mark, uh, and thanks everyone for joining.